I want to show you something. I did a little bit of a word study, which I'm not making available to you on paper because it's it's, it's probably the world's worst uh, chicken scratch. But I took the time to write it on my tablet, and I want us to look at these words. They pertain to what I talked about yesterday out of Matthew 6. And I want you to take a look at something. The word we're looking at in the King James for alms, and I put it here in the Greek for you, tried to spell it out phonetically, but what we're looking at in Matthew 6, 2, 6, 3, and 6, 4 is a noun. And I also want you to take notice of something. You only have two occasions where it occurs in Luke. So let's put a line here for a minute. And also have you notice that the word for alms itself is absent from Mark and John. In fact, what's even more staggering, sometimes you have to look at what's not there, is that these are the total occurrences in the New Testament of the word alms. So I want you to think of something. If we go through the book of Acts, this is an isolated event, 3-2, This is an isolated event. This is um, Dorcas uh, or uh, Tabitha. This is, the, this is the centurion who We'll, we'll, we'll look at each one of these. And this is the uh, man that sat at the gate, beautiful, at the temple, begging alms. This last one here comes out of Paul's mouth where he says he, he, brought, he was here to bring alms um, to his nation, to his people. We'll, we'll look at each of these. But I want you to see something very important, which is, remember I said the book of Acts acts like a bridge between the Gospels and the epistles. And the epistles we know are primary, primarily letters to churches. And you do not find this word, iliamasini, appearing in the letters to the churches. It is missing in action. Now, this is what's important. We'll find other words being used in reference to the collection. And there's a multiplicity of them. But let's just kind of focus on one thing. This particular word uh, in the Gospels, now we're looking at Matthew and Luke, it's not as though we have abundant occurrences. We've got five of them, and three of the five occur clustered one after another in the sixth chapter. Now, it's like anything else. I'm not saying this is not important because Jesus will make uh, make clear that for some, giving to the poor, for example, to the rich young ruler who came to them and said, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, because the man had much goods. Remember, the man said, I've done all these, I've kept the law, check, 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 I've done all these things. And Jesus said, sell what you have, give to the poor, and follow me. Now, people have taken that statement that Jesus said to that man as that's what one should do in following Christ. Sell everything, give to the poor. I can tell you, that was that man. That was his issue. Why does it say he had much goods? So it's very clear. He checked the box for all the law that he kept, but this one thing, and Jesus says, this one thing, this one thing for you, brother, is your money. You're not willing to part with it. Now, that's not a blanket for every single person. That was that man's issue. So it's not as though, be, just simply because the word eliomasini does not occur other places, that it's not important. We can deduce certain things. For example, when Zacchaeus was seeing Jesus approach, he's up in the tree and tells them to come down, they go inside the house, and when they come out, who knows what that conversation was, but when they come out, 
Zacchaeus says he's not all. See, these are the things you've got to look for. He doesn't say, I've sold all of my, my property and given to the poor. He says, half of what I have, I've given to the poor. And if I've stolen anything from anybody because he was a crook, I'll restore them, I think, three or fourfold. The point is, you can see certain places that are of great importance where Jesus might have put uh, a premium on something that is essentially what is unfolded in the latter part of the sixth chapter, which is seeking God first, seeking God, seeking His kingdom, His righteousness, and then all these other things will be added. So if you really think about it, it's not as though we have a lot of occurrences of the Word, but we have a lot of, uh, we'll call them spiritual connotations that lead towards a principle. So I don't want you to think, well, it only occurs five times, therefore. But where it occurs, as I explained yesterday, I drew my umbrella for you, and I said it occurs under the banner of righteousness, and this is where I feel there has been the greatest amount of confusion. And I don't want, I don't want to be restrained. I spend my time, you know, doing these type of studies all the time. It's, that's, that's what I live for. I love to dig into God's Word, and I like to, you know, get, get, get me the magnifying glass. Come on, let's go, right? Some of you are a little bit, uh, well, some of you are too old and some of you are too young, but, you know, Nancy Drew, right? Uh, so this type of study requires that if I find something, I not be hindered to say it. And that even may fly in the face of something that I previously said, because it's only when you begin really pulling apart. That's why I said nobody can say they know everything and nobody's infallible. I, I, it really does insult me because I believe it insults God. We can respect the person of God, which we ought to, but there's nobody alive in a pulpit or in a pew infallible. So when you settle that matter, it means that it's possible, and we all do make mistakes. Now, with that being said, I want you to take a look. First, we're going to make clear what exactly these, these references look like. So we know what they look like in, in Matthew 6, 2, 3, and 4. It's being referred to as alms. We know the first verse is not alms, but righteousness. When you do the righteousness of you, be careful the righteousness of you. Remember that, definite article. I'm not really quite sure if that will make sense, but eventually when we come to maybe do a whole grammar on this whole passage, it makes perfect sense. There's a definite article pointing out something definite right there and maybe not so uh, definite or a little bit more ambiguous as the verses go on. Now, 6.2, 6.3, 6.4, that's clear. And we're dealing with nouns. Let's look at Luke 11:14 and see what that reads there, because there's only two occurrences in Luke. That makes it pretty easy. Luke 11:14. So let's start back at where Jesus is going to uh, begin to address certain people. The Lord said unto him. Let's go back to verse 37. He spake a certain Pharisee beside him to dine with him. He went in, sat down to meet. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. And the Lord said unto him, Now do you Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? But rather... Give alms of such things as you have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. So it's just, there's no, um, there's not an order here. There's just uh, a recognition, if you will, a statement that's being made to the Pharisee. But woe unto you, Pharisee, for you tithe, this is the similar passage, you tithe mint and rue and all manners of herbs, Passover, judgment, and the love of God. These you ought to have done and not leave the other undone. So. There's no, um, there's no do, it's still a noun. Remember, that's what we're looking at. The principle is how these are being approached. The next one comes just 
the chapter later, 1233, Luke 1233. And so here you have Christ saying, sell what you have, sell that you have, give alms, provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So two uh, references, and this particular one, what I'm finding with, with Luke, I used to think that the majority of Luke might have been based more on Mark, but that's not the case. A lot of Luke seems to be based greatly on Matthew, and I'm not just saying this is a random thought. I've encountered at least uh, to this point, I believe, a dozen things that line up um, out of order with Matthew and obviously are, are not in Mark, and that doesn't make it erroneous or wrong. Those are those interesting things included or excluded that make the whole tapestry of God. So we don't have any, anything except we know that these two references here being referred to as alms, these three references here we've seen, of course, as alms, but then put into action. You see it put into action in Acts 3. Here we have uh, the clearest picture of this Greek word being made clear for us in Acts 3.2. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. So it cannot be misunderstood. This is the same Greek word being used in Matthew 6, 2, 6, 3, and 6, 4. Same word. Read on. Who seeing Peter... And John, about to go into the temple, asked an alms. Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. So that tells you this is a charitable act, right? Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give thee. So it's kind of amazing that you know, the man's there begging, and he's begging for coin. He's begging for anything. So I want you to connect some dots here. These are, as I said, not random words, same Greek word. And this word will appear one more time after the man stood up and he walked and he entered with them into the temple. Boy, I would have liked to have seen that one. You know, I mean, look out all you healing weirdos on TV. This is the original stuff here, you know. I won't have anything to give you, but get up in the name of Jesus and poof, straightway he's leaping, standing up, walked, entered in with them into the temple. Can you imagine all the people as they walked in? They must have been <gasps> walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. So very clear. You cannot be mistaken. The, the connotation and meaning of this word here, this man was begging, whether he was begging for money, they, Peter says, silver and gold have I not, whether he was begging for food or whatever he was, he was begging. He was just begging. He, he was begging, all right? I did say that if you look up in a dictionary of English, it's a strange dictionary that I have. I should have brought it, but it's English root origins, and you'll find that the root al, 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 al um, was associated with um, to nourish or to feed, which I believe has to have some connection with alms, because in the process of giving alms, one may be able to nourish oneself or to obtain food to be nourished. The next one in our example here is uh, Acts 9, 36, which I've already pointed out, is uh, the woman who is referred to in the ninth chapter, 9, 36. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. Would you like to be named Dorcas? <laughs> I would like you to meet my friend Dorcas. Pleased to meet you, Dorcas. 
This woman was full of good works and did alms deed, and uh, good works and alms deeds which she did. Now, same word being used. And you notice how it's a little modification. Uh, we're reading alms deeds, but same word. Good work, full of good works and alms deeds. And I don't think we, ha I think you, you're going to take my word. You've noted the, the scriptures. Here is the centurion. In fact, no, actually, I want you to turn there because there's something interesting that is said. Well, we're right here. There's something interesting that's said about the centurion's alms, uh, which we should take note of, which actually dovetails back into uh, the discussion of 6, 2, 6, 3, and 6, 4 in Matthew's uh, gospel where it talks about the reward with the Father. I want you to look at this. Uh, in Acts 10, there was a certain man, Caesarea, named, uh, called Cornelius, centurion of the band called the Italian band, a uh, devout man, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Now, if you read on, uh, I want you to see what happens in verse 4. Uh, he looked on him, he was afraid, he said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. That's kind of interesting. They're come up bef as a memorial before God. I really do think that, you know, we can read right by this and kind of put some super spiritual spin on it, but the reality is that God sees these things. And this is why uh, Jesus very clear admonition to not make a spectacle, don't make a spectacle of yourself in the act of doing. Here's somebody who actually, uh, if you go back to the third verse, it says, He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. So obviously, vision or not, reality or not, this which he was doing got the attention whether vision or not, I'm, I'm not really worried about that, got the attention of somebody, even if it was just in his mind. My point is, you know, we, we tend to do things down here, and we tend to do things, as I said, we're, we're hungry for people to see that we're doing something good. And that is, that's everywhere around us. That is, everywhere you look, you are confronted with even our TV programs, some of these shows are designed to show you in 30 minutes how not only will all the problems of the world be solved, but how they are doing these good things. And I guess if you're just doing them in the world, you're doing them in the world and you'll have the reward of the world. And we do things, whatever it is we're doing, under that umbrella. Well, we're doing them with the knowledge he sees. And really, Avoiding anybody else. That doesn't mean you go crazy. Some people, you know, they get super legalistic. But even for this man, doing the things he was doing, and I don't think he did them to make a spectacle. I think he did them in sincerity. He came up as a memorial in front of God. Last one of these, they're all, it's all the same Greek word. The last one of these is, as I said, out of Paul's mouth in Acts 24. And Acts 24 and 17, Paul says, Now after many years I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings. That's an interesting verse we should deal with in the future. That's not my interest tonight, but I want you to notice that there are two things being said, alms to my nation and offerings. That's why I said to you, there's several different types of giving in the New Testament, and that's quite apparent. And I don't want to homogenize them. Now, do they all fit under the umbrella of Matthew 6, 1? Absolutely. They're all, let's call them righteous activities. They're, they're righteous activities of God's nature operating in and through you. So it's pretty clear. I want to make sure everybody here, there's nobody that doubts. This is all the same word. Once that's clear, and we've, we've been looking at a noun, let's go to, I'm, I'm going to go backwards, which is we've looked at the fullest dimension of this word, uh, iliomasone. The next word 
if you were, and I've included the Strong's here, if you were looking at um, the word ilio, ilion, and iliomasuni is, is the word essentially we just looked at. And I'm shrinking the word back to get down to uh, the, the bare essentials here. So I'm on my way down. We're not going up, we're going down. So iliamon um, only occurs in all the Gospels just one time. It is the word for merciful. And outside of the Gospels occurring in Hebrews 2.17, it is an adjective. Now, why is this important? Again, sometimes when you do a word study, you have to look at does it, how often does it appear or how infrequently it appears. Is this a hapex, one time, one hit wonder? So this is an interesting thing. This word as an adjective, let's just put a line through Hebrews 2.17 for a second and say just in the Gospels, it only occurs one time and occurs in the Beatitudes, and it's quite remarkable as an adjective. That's all. Now, it's not that this is going to change anything in your life. I'm trying to show you something, that we went from alms, from the word alms as a noun, going down to an adjective of the same word, iliamon. You see the root, if you would just add a little ending here, we'd have the same as alms, but it's a shorter cut down, and only occurring one time. That's very relevant. Now, based on what I have been looking at, it's very suggestive. There's something, because it occurs where it occurs in the Beatitudes, it's very suggestive. Hold that thought. Uh-oh, she says that very often and leaves me holding. <laughs> All right. We're going down. We're not going up. Elios. This is the, the noun of Strong's 1656, they're all related. Elios is being translated mercy. And this is what's so very interesting. A few of these, we'll make a line right here, Matthew 9, 13, 12, 12, 7. I need to look at this to pick the right one to make the right statement to you. Let me see here. Yes, so um, let me just read to you Matthew 12, 7. For you. You're going to see what, where this is going to lead. In Matthew 12, 7, um, this particular reference that we're looking at for ilios is also a noun. And this is coming out of our, our Lord's mouth. And he says, but if he had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, he would not have condemned the guiltless. And this is a... a Rima, uh, out of Hosea 6.6. 6. When I went to look at this, I wonder if I wrote it down here. That would make my life much easier. I probably didn't. Yes, I did. <laughs> so this is out of Hosea 6.6. 6. And my curiosity was such to know how this word might appear in the Hebrew, because I'm going to go back to the Septuagint and do this all over again with all these words as they appear in the Septuagint. You're going to be surprised. Maybe not. But from Hosea 6.6, 6, strangely enough, this is being translated chesed, not as we would have thought tzedek. Remember, tzedek is righteousness or some, some form of these. Usually it has the uh, feminine form. But here we have chesed, and chesed is God's unfailing, unwavering love, his mercy love, if you will. And it has um, shades of meaning, but the essential meaning of it is God's unfailing love. So I thought this was interesting that this word is changing before our eyes. Let me keep working my way down, because some of these examples are just to show you where they occur. And again, I would have you note that Mark and John uh, do not even have this word. Now, I really think when words are missing out of John, I always go to this. John understood the word was from the very beginning. 
And so there's many things that he doesn't even bother using that type or that form of language because I believe it's assumed he's writing from the eternal perspective. And we will say it's by revelation of God's Spirit, the mercy of God has been revealed to him. It's almost like it's axiomatic. I, I don't need to tell you because it's, it's there. It's like so many other things. So John is missing and Mark, but consistently Matthew and Luke uh, have these. And if you want to break this down, you'll see that uh, mercy appears in the opening chapter of Luke, uh, 150, 54, 58, 72, and 78. That's um, the uh, nativity, or actually probably John the Baptist, Zachariah and Elizabeth, and then one other time. So when you kind of break it down like that, you see uh, some interesting things happening. But let's keep going down. We've, I think we have one more step down to make. Ilio, there we go. Now we're, we're going in some direction, moving in form here. Ilio, 1653, Strong's, this is a verb. Sometimes translated mercy, sometimes translated compassion. Now what's so interesting is that, I want you to look back again, we had the uh, adjective appear, and so in the Beatitudes you've got a verbal form and an adjective form of, and they are not the same, obviously, they appear differently. It's the same word, one is an adjective, one is a verb. Now why am I doing this exercise? Because I want you to see something absolutely uh, great, which is, We'll go along in our King James and we'll read mercy, 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 mercy. And then you get to this passage right here, uh, Matthew 18, 33, which is one of my favorite passages in Scripture, one of my other favorite ones, um, about the man who was forgiven much. I, that's in my message on forgiveness. The man who was forgiven everything and his Lord had compassion on him and forgave him his whole debt. And I thought this was very interesting because there's a whole word play in that passage. And interestingly enough, the verbal form of Elio is being used. But when they went to translate it, um, I think they were rather inconsistent. Poor, poor translators, by the way. I, have, I, have great, I do have pity on anyone who would undertake a translation. Um, so, shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? Now, would you like to try and figure out, are those the same words? Does anybody care? I do. This seems like a nutty exercise, but it'll show you that sometimes we're reading along in different forms will help us completely blur out the fact what is this? Matthew 18. And I said that is verse 33. So here we have 1833, where it says, Shouldest not thou ha also have had compassion on thy fellow servant? The compassion there in the verbal form is in an infinitive. It's very interesting. And then as it says here, even as I have had pity on thee. Well, guess what? These are the same word. They're just two different verbal forms. And what I omitted to do here is do my famous little two. They're just different forms. So um, the King James translators have compassion and pity, but all the while it's the same Greek word, same Greek verb. Hmm. Okay, so don't you just love that? <laughs> all right, let me go forward because, um, all right, here we go. So I'm, I want to try and go back to the Septuagint to illustrate something. Sometimes something is not as cut and dry as we think. Why, for example, when the King James translators translated the, um, the verses, and we have in Matthew 6, 1, alms, 6, 2, alms, 6, 3, alms, 6, 4, alms, but we know the first one is dikaiosuni, 
and the three after that are iliomacinae. So I want you to take a look what happens in the Septuagint. You know the Septuagint, of course, is the Old Testament Hebrew, Old Testament put into the Greek language. And so here's what happens. You've got several situations here. Let's isolate these. These are all essentially, uh, in Hebrew, we're concerned with the trilateral root system. So you can see these are just uh, different vowels underneath, which will change the meaning of the word. But we've got chesed and emet, truth, solid firmness, that are, will all, if you have a, uh, a concordance for the Septuagint, and you look up this word, same word we saw as alms in the King James, in the New Testament, will have multiple words that will be uh, communicating eliomasoni. This is why I said to you, sometimes we, we think we know a concept, and you almost have to keep peeling back the onion to understand a little bit better what it might mean, or what it might have meant, better yet, when we talk about the Septuagint, it's real easy to get blurry-eyed and say, oh, well, didn't Jesus read out of that? Yeah, but the Septuagint, obviously, we know is two to three hundred years, forgive me for saying it this way, but before Christ was in the temple reading from the Septuagint. Um, so it's really important to see how the scholars of that day, uninfluenced by English and other languages, would have taken Hebrew concepts and put them into the Greek. So I'm asking you to see something in a strange way, not necessarily looking at directly how this occurred, but if we were to go back, let's take a look at a situation here. Genesis 47:29. might surprise you how tricky this word is. Genesis 47, we're all over the map, it's a Bible study. That's what you're supposed to do, is turn the pages. So here we have Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. The whole age of Jacob was 147 years. The time drew nigh that Israel must die. He called his son Joseph, said unto him, If now I found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. That's a strange way of finding grace. And deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. Now let's take a look at this. So um, you're looking at the word for kindly. And I'm just curious to see... Um, we'll just do this while I have everybody, everybody's finger in the right place here. Um, 26, 17, let's see if they match up. They should match up. 26, 17. Almost there. They do match up for once. Sometimes this Bible has some interesting issues. So, what happens here is where the word and deal kindly. Let's find a Septuagint and make sure that I'm giving you the right information. I don't say that to make you worried because I know I checked it before, but some of you hardheads. Let's see. So we have 47 and 29. And here we have the word eliomasone. So this word we would think would be primarily translated sudeka, but sometimes it's being translated chesed, God's un unconditional love, an unconditional love. 
no strings attached. I don't think at this time it's used that way, but as you progress into the Bible, it is. Deuteronomy 6.25 has a different... So in, in the Septuagint, Deuteronomy 6.25 reads iliomasoni, but take a look at what happens. You'll see that that particular Deuteronomy 6.25 is going to be a Tzedekah word. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. So our righteousness. So now we've got two words, two different words, two separate and distinct words, right? And you say, well, yeah, that's great. I see it. There can be two words. But what happens when it gets, wait, there's more. It gets better. I want you to take a look with me because you'll see what gets my attention. We, we don't just want to say these are necessarily synonyms because in Psalm 33, you're going to have this triple just word occurrence that will have you say, well, yeah, this all occurs in one place. Psalms 33 in verse 5, He loveth righteousness and judgment. Now, what is that might have been, there's two other psalms that do this where you've got three. This one may only contain two, so bear with me. Psalm 33 and 5. The word, for the word of the Lord is right, and all of his works are faithful. He loves mercy and judgment. So you have here eliomosony, mercy and judgment. What does the King James read? Righteousness and judgment. So we have a combination, by the way, of two words being used here side by side. And there's another psalm where all three words or a combination will occur. So I don't, I don't want you to think um, simply of this word. When, when the translators uh, took iliomasone into the English and made it alms, um, I want you to think very carefully that what, what may have been underneath this word, going back to the Hebrew, carries with it righteousness, which is what's in our first verse of 6.1, but also unconditional love, and a cognate of firm faith. So I don't want this to just be one word that you just say, okay, well, I heard you say it's mercy giving. Because underneath that, there are nuances, which we know we've seen many times, for example, just like what Dr. Scott had pulled from the Hebrew going into the Greek with the three words that bring us to pistis, to faith, three different words in the Hebrew that bring us one word in the Greek, you have a similar situation going on here. You've got multiple words that are underneath this Greek word, and I think they give it the shades and color that going into the New Testament, although not used frequently, we see charitable giving also seemingly contains this form of love, and some form, if you will, of amet, they're, they, they're all meshed into this word. That's why I said don't think that when you read something, it just has a flat meaning to it. Now, as I said, I went backwards and forwards. I've taken you into the Septuagint. Did I go one more? I think I did. Um, this is another elios, elin word from the Septuagint, and you can see now we're going into... Uh, a little bit different. In fact, this word should be familiar to you. Raham. Uh, Psalm 18, I will love thee, O Lord. The Dr. Scott's Wumi, if you remember that, that's this word here. So now we're moving in a different direction. Now what should all this mean to you? Why did I do this? Because from all of these words, you can get a glimpse at the fact that if we go back to the reason I peeled apart Matthew 6, 1, 2, 3, and 4, 
that first act, the righteousness of you, which is not your righteousness, that's his filthy rags, but the righteousness of you, that which is the outraying of God working in you, if you will, um, has these elements, these ingredients there. And when I talk about a canopy, I want you to see that these words are equally knit into the canopy. So the word that we've just looked at flip back into the English, mercy, merciful, and alms. And then I ask you to stop for a minute because there are other words being translated mercy, compassion, and I've dealt with a few of these over the years, but I just wrote down a few of them. Um, so we have the word oiktiro or oiktirmos. These are the mercies of God, compassion. We've got, if you remember, I taught on a word that was the bowels of mercy, um, which is also being translated compassion. You've got another Greek word, elaskomai, for God to be merciful, from elasmos, elastirion, the mercy seat, propitiation. So you've got a number of words. Some of these words are going to be uniquely used of God. Remember, I said to you at the beginning, I said this unique thing that happens in Matthew 5, 7 between an adjective and a verb, it's very unique because it doesn't happen anywhere else. And I believe coming out of our Lord's mouth, it should be something we pay attention to, but it doesn't happen anywhere else. Where this call for us to be merciful, if you will, let's, let, me, let me quote it to you, let me read because I'm, I'm worried to misquote it to you. Um, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Merciful, adjective, they shall obtain mercy, verb. It's the only place where that occurs. And keep in mind what I'm saying to you is very significant because somebody will read this and say, well, okay, well, you've just, you just dumped a whole garbage pail of words on me. What does this mean? Follow my thinking. I said this is the only way in this occurrence that you can get any glimmer of understanding. And forgive me if I jump around, but I'm going to go to verse 8 because I want you to, I really want you to wrap your mind around something. I've taught on this before in the Beatitudes where Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And you'll have a lot of people going around saying, Well, I must be pure. I must get pure. I must purify myself. But what have I taught you? That word for pure is catheterized. Blessed are the catheterized in, in their heart. And you can only get catheterized in your heart by the great physician. He's the one doing the catheterizing. He, he helps to, uh, why do you need a catheter? Just if, if in real life, why do you need one? Because you, your body is no longer capable of eliminating on its own or something has happened to hinder the elimination of things that need to be exited and ushered out of the body that normal functions would normally take care of. So think of it this way. You cannot understand what I just said without understanding that God must do that. God must catheterize the heart. And so then, blessed are the pure, the catheterized in the heart, for they shall see God. Now let's talk about the merciful. Blessed are the merciful. We're talking about a group of people being described by an adjective, for they shall obtain mercy. Not they will actively seize it, they shall be recipients of it. And put in that same mindset is why you cannot just wrap all this up in a ball and say, okay, yeah, it's alms, okay, yeah. There's something about this word attached to all of these cognates that say, this is a form of something, yes, heathen people do good, good things all the time, but this type of thing that Jesus is pointing to, he says, don't do it to be seen, don't make a spectacle. Well, believe me, if it's just the flesh working, you want to be seen. If it's just the flesh operating, you want people to know. But if it's the spirit and God's nature flowing through you and working in you, you're going to want to read this word and say, that's exactly what my Lord said, that's how I'm going to do it. 
the mind comes into obedience. So when you talk about the merciful as describing a people, it's the same concept that I just pointed out about the ones catheterized in heart. A person who is not in the Word will not understand this. They may go out and do good things and, and be very charitable and very giving, but they won't understand this principle. That in fact, when God has done an operation on the inside of a person, there are certain things that will become um, part of the fabric of your being, and this is one of them. You, you, you're not going to care anymore whether anybody sees especially when the Lord says He doesn't want you to make a spectacle of yourself to be seen of men. Why? Because you have no reward with your Father, right alongside Him. Now, I took all these words to say all of these lead back to a concept of mercy, not compassion, mercy. When you do your mercy giving, and I wanted to make this clear, Picture the umbrella I drew. I do not believe Jesus exhausted all of the things that one operating under the Spirit, under the guidance of God, it's not limited to these three things, but these three things, these three things that the Pharisees love to put on display because if you take notice, that's what he's juxtaposing it with. Be not like these people. They love and they have their reward. They do this, they have their reward. They're glorified of men, they have their reward. So it's being juxtaposed. This is why when he says, except your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, well, how, how can they? these people are out there doing all these things and check box, check box, well, except. And the only way that is, is he's working in you. Now, don't confuse this. We just did a word study to demonstrate something. Don't confuse the things that are, we'll call them the implant of God's nature in merciful and benevolent things versus the things that should be operating anyway. The great tragedy, which uh, I've referenced many times but not in this particular way, is the Corinthian church. Paul says, now concerning the collection, and has to come back a second time to say, now listen, don't embarrass me by not doing what you said you would do. There was some disconnect there, and we can talk about the fact that they were they had this great gift of the Spirit and they had all these gifts, but the question is the greatest, the greatest display of the gift they lack, which tells me that there was a disconnect there. Not that they didn't hear with their ears, they, they had this letter read to them and probably, as I've said many times, not just two but possibly four. And the point is that there are different forms of giving. I believe they all will fall under the 6-1 umbrella. So when people say, well, are you trying to distinguish the diversities inside the church? Absolutely. I'm trying to separate the types of activities that went on in Christ's day that were carried on into Paul's day, but the words will change, different words will be introduced, a main word will reoccur over and over again, and it's impossible for us to define this by just saying, here, take that and go. If there are shades and nuances in between, I'd like to distinguish them. The Koinonia community, don't get confused with the fact that before anything, what the Koinonia community represents is not just that they, they gave everything they had and they shared it amongst themselves. Yes, as I said, that's where we get our, our, our understanding without the uh, cruel oligarchic ruler uh, of communism. But what we're talking about in the Koinonia community are words first in their verbal form and then in a noun form. The fellowship or the partaking as a community of faith. And when you begin to explore all of the uses of the word Koinonia through not just Galatians, by the way, you will find that the Koinonia community was not just a community jointly sharing in the things they had, but they were joint participants with the Holy Spirit, joint participants in the suffering of Christ. You begin to look at that and, how do I say this to you? Maybe in the fewest words, when Paul in Ephesians 4 talks about the oneness and the unity of the body of Christ, one Spirit, one Lord, one baptism, 
trying to describe how it's not a whole bunch of things going on here, one activity, which is the design of God, and then in Corinthians he talks about the many members that are joined up to that body, but he speaks of unity, and the koinonia community was meant, by the way, to bring people together, much like the table of the Lord, communion. Communion, same word, we get that same cognate, designed to bring people together. And just like the table of the Lord, the subject of the koinonia giving community has been abused by the nuts and the charlatan, charlatans out there, and the devil has made sure to make this something that has teared apart and separated people. If you really think about it, they're one and the same, the communion of Christ, the koinonia community. We'll look at the word, we'll pull it apart, we'll look at the uses, and you'll see that it's not just Paul saying, let the one who is uh, taught koinonia with the one who teaches him, but a whole concept of unity in the faith, unity in the spirit, unity even partakers of Christ's suffering, koinoniaing in that suffering. So when you really put all this together, you realize that that word carries a lot more weight, not just on the level of giving, but what really should be a unifying force in the body of Christ. Again, it's another one of these things which I've just told you between in the last 24 hours of how much division I've heard on the subject of giving, and people will say, well, uh, well that's legalism and that's that. Well, listen, if you have a bad spirit and you've got the Judas spirit, you'll find any excuse. If I said, oh, well, we're not tithing anymore, then you say, well, I can't give it all. Well, I, we can't give it all, so we'll just give a little bit. We'll give what, what, what God has prospered. Well, uh, God hasn't prospered me that much because uh, uh, I went out to buy some smokes and a bottle of hooch and I don't got too much left. <laughs> There's your prosperity for you. So we need to separate these words. I want to separate them. I don't care after we're done if you want to put them all back together, but it's important for me. I was saying this to somebody earlier today. It's very tempting. I'm not tempted by it, but it is, I can see the temptation on the part of people, good people of God, who instruct the people of God to give and to have stewardship. It's very, it could be very tempting for somebody to just homogenize everything and say, now, this falls under this, so just do it like this. doesn't matter. Even if it is a negative for me. And when I say a negative, maybe some people will say, well, well, I thought that's the way I ought to be doing this, so therefore they cease doing it that way. And maybe it's, forgive me for saying it, less profitable for the church. I'd rather have less profitable with clear understanding and not mislead anybody. I've had a lifetime of being misled. And maybe you can, you can say, well, that's kind of a puritanical statement. Well, maybe I desire to just purely live on this word. I don't have anything else to go by. Everything else that I've touched in my lifetime has been sand slipping through my hands. This is the only solid thing I've touched, so I'm careful to approach it this way. I really want to know what God says. I want to know what God wants me to do. And the only way to do that, I'm sorry, the English is our language, but it's not going to help you to get the details. So we go through these laborious exercises. I did most of the work already. What I want you to walk away with is, I understand, here's this umbrella or canopy that Christ says these, these activities that are yours, that you may do. They're not yours because they're yours, they're, they're His, that He's given to you, flowing through you. These expressions of His person, don't make a show of them. And very much like Galatians, where we, we, we read about the, the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit, and these lists could never exhaust. When I read the works of the flesh, I recognize that there are things in there that are not listed, that should be there. I could add to that list. And I also know it's impossible, uh, fruit of the Spirit. Paul wasn't trying to write uh, a, a definite, uh, exhaustive 
this is what God looks like because no one, well, Paul has seen the risen Christ, so we'll give an exception, but no man has truly come, no human being has truly come to know God in his fullness and in his, in his entirety until he is before him truly in perfection, which in perfection, not in perfection, which we cannot attain here on earth. Too bad because that's what uh, Dr. Tozer believed. But, <laughs> but uh, I like to read Tozer, I just read carefully. But anyway, as a sidebar, uh, I'm just saying to you that in separating this, just put this down as one part, and this is the mercy part. And we'll, we'll fit some other things under the umbrella, but this one is clear pretty much now. I hope it's clear that this is not homogenized. Dr. Scott used to say the church is not a charity, so I don't want anybody getting confused about this. If you look at this word as we did through Acts with the one who is begging through Dorcas, the woman who was full of good uh, works and alms deeds, through the centurion, and through Paul, who distinguishes even those words. He says, I came to bring alms and offerings. Opposite that tells you there's two different things going on. And I said, we'll probably encounter at least three different types of monies uh, being discussed in the New Testament in terms of giving. And I, I want us to explore those words. Some of them will be familiar. Some of them will not be as familiar, so we'll do all that. But right now, tonight, the point has been made. I hope you'll just kind of digest that. We'll move on to the next word, not tonight. I don't want to wipe out what we did tonight. It's a lot of work. Word studies, you've got to process a lot of information, sift it down, and then have something to grab hold of that you can take away. So the takeaway is we've isolated what the essential meaning of this word is. It carries colors with it, sits under the banner of what Christ started six, Matthew 6, 1 with, and will add under that umbrella from the other portions of Scripture that belong under that same canopy of righteousness. Now, I need you to get on the telephone. Get busy. <laughs> Our hearts in one accord Worship and bow down before